we thought we'd have the kid president introduce the series, uh, Growing Transformational Leaders. This is um, a very important part of where we are, especially in not just our community, in our nation right now. We, we really need leaders. and We need leaders who can actually transform the people around them. And today we're introducing the series, and part one in the series is we're going to be talking about discovering the leader within you, um, which is very important. But I do want to say throughout the rest of the summer, we're going to be talking about um, these different parts. Um, there'll be some things about leadership, but inside of this leadership series, we're going to be talking about all of the different generations that you, we kind of introduced in the last couple of times where I mentioned the baby boomers, the Gen X, the Gen Y, and we're going to talk about how all those people work together and how we need to actually do different things as leaders to actually help each other and be what God wants us to be in our communities, not just in the church world, but in your work world, wherever you are, because we need each other. So today, we're going to be talking about part one, discovering the leader within you. So we, we're going to focus really on just you today. Uh, and although we, it takes that focus on you to actually bring the focus where we need it in the next generation. So we're talking about developing next generation leaders, those who are younger than us. Um, you know, we, we're dealing with, even as I look in this room, probably three generations, but if there was anyone, some, there are people my age whose parents are still alive, that makes five generations. And we are across all of that spectrum of different beings, and we're trying to do what Jesus put us in the earth to do. And, and when I say that, it's not just to bring more people into the kingdom of God, but there, is, there are things that you individually are assigned to do based on why you are here, and we need to develop next generation leaders for that. See, I believe this. I believe that every young adult need to learn leadership skills, not just whatever someone gives you. I mean, I kind of grew up, the way I grew up, I wasn't focused on being a leader. I didn't think I could be a leader. I didn't see myself as a leader when I was younger. And, but I believe every young person, every young adult today need to learn leadership skills. And, there, and one of the reasons for that is, I, I don't know if we've ever had this before, where five generations are in the earth at the same time, and we need to learn how to lead each other. We've, I'm sure some of you, you've been in, in a workplace where some young buck is now your boss, and he doesn't know how to relate to you, and you're tired of him, and you want to smack him and tell him he don't know, you know, he's still wet behind the ears and all that kind of stuff. We need to learn how to work together because I believe regardless of your age, we need to learn how to lead each generation. Each generation needs to learn how to lead all the other generations because that's what we need now in the earth. And just to remind you, we have what we call the builders, and that's the people that are my parents' age, although my parents have gone on, uh, but many of you, your parents are still alive and they probably are you know, builders. I'm a boomer myself. And then we have busters. I have kids that are busters and millennials and grandkids that are millennials and Gen Zs. And so we have to learn how to, and we have people, I have people in my family who are in each one of those categories, and we need to learn how to be leaders in each one of those categories. So I want to start this off by asking you a question. And that question is, how many of you that are listening to me right now are completely comfortable with calling yourself a leader? Show of hands. You're completely comfortable with calling yourself a leader? Show of hands. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to get some more votes. <laughs> um, and I kind of ex expected that. You know, when we, when that question is asked, Many of us are just like I was when I was younger and even as I was going through life. And even as I listened to my dad tell some of his stories. You know, my dad, he spent some time in the U.S. Army. And he didn't want to be a leader, but they kept trying to make, trying to let it, tell him that he should be based on the way he, would, he was doing things. And, but he didn't see himself as a leader, so he would always do whatever it took not to get promoted to that place. But 
What we want to talk about today is you discovering the leader within you. Because if you don't feel like you can call yourself a leader, you don't think you're a leader, there's something that's missing on the inside. Because when you look at the dictionary, here's what they say a leader is, and I want to go further than this, but in the dictionary it says a leader is a a person who leads, right? That makes sense. A person who leads, a person who has commanding authority or influence. And one of the greater authorities that you can have is the authority of influence. And many of you, you're, how many of you have had a new baby come in the house? And when a new baby is born in the house, they have a lot of influence. They start leading you and training you. They train you, if you want to get some sleep, you better do this. <laughs> they start training. So influence is a very strong um, piece of authority. And basically, it's influence. It's a type of authority, but that person becomes a leader. We all need to learn how to become a leader. But we have made leadership something so big in our minds, and our culture has done this for us, because we look at, when we think of leaders, we think of names like Martin Luther King, um, you know, um, name some for me. Let me let you help me. Who are some great leaders that you think about? President Obama, and we look at different people in big categories, who've done things that we feel like we could never do, right? And so we don't think that we are a leader because we make leadership so much bigger. We look at the idea of if whatever I'm thinking is not big enough to change the world, and that's how we kind of look at it. Is it world changing? Is it something that can make everything different? But here's what I want to introduce to you today is if we want to change the world, we really have to change the world by changing one person at a time. And it's not where one person is going to stand up on a stage like this with many people listening and say something that's going to change the whole community. We have to be who we are to the person that we're dealing with on an everyday basis to be the kind of leader that we need, especially in today's age. So I want to share a story um, with you, and it's the Drew Dudley story. I don't know if you've heard of Drew Dudley. Drew Dudley is, um, he's an activist, but he's, he's a writer, he's an author, and he has, um, his story is this, and this is kind of where I'm going to lead into today's message. He was at a school, he's, he's in Canada, he was at a school in Canada, a small university, and he had been there, and he was advertising and promoting uh, some health benefits for some different things, and so while he was there on campus, and he'd been there for several years, or at least he ended up being there for several years. And one day, he, this student came to him and said that since I, this was, he was, this was going to be his last day there. And this student came to him and said, I remember you from the first day that I came to the school. And I was standing in line. Well, first of all, she's, the lady, the girl told him that the day before, my parents and I, we were in a hotel waiting for me to register the next day. And I was so afraid. This is my first day at a university away from home. I was so afraid. I didn't think I could really do it. I was ready to go back home, just scared. And so my parents, she, the girl said, was amazing because they said to me, they said, look, we love you, but just wait until tomorrow. Go to register. And if any, at any time you feel that you really can't do this, then just let us know and we'll take you home. And so, which is really a story, another story of great leadership. Sometimes we don't know how to be a leader. Some of us would have said, look, <laughs> I, pay, <laughs> I, pay, I paid all this money up to this point. You're going to school. <laughs> you better learn. Anyways, but parents were great parents. And so the next day she's standing in line to register and she starts to feel that feeling that she talked about where she was just overwhelmed and felt like she couldn't make it. And she said that, and she's telling Drew this, and so she's telling him that just as I was about to tell my parents, take me home, she said, you stepped out of the student union building with this stupid looking hat on with a bucket full of lollipops and you were going down the line giving the kids that are registering the lollipop. And when you got to me, you stopped and you stared at me 
and you just looked, and you looked at the young man that was next to me, who was also a stranger, and you pulled out a lollipop out of the bucket and gave it to that boy and said, you, sir, need to give this lollipop to this beautiful young lady, which is embarrassing the boy. He, she even tells the story. She says the boy turns red and, he didn't, and was so afraid that he didn't even look at her, but he just held the lollipop out for her to get it. And so she said, I took the lollipop since I felt so bad for the boy. And I took the lollipop. And just as I reached to take the lollipop, she said, then you, Drew, said this to my parents. You said, look, look at this. First day away from home, and she's already, already taking candy from a stranger. Then everybody just start cracking up and laughing. But she said in that moment, something happened that caused her, and she doesn't know what it is. She just said something happened that caused me to know that I can do this that I'm going to be okay here. This is going to be a good place for me. And then she decided not to leave. And so she said to him, so I heard that you were leaving, and this is your last day, and I wanted you to know much you have, what you have done to change my life. And just that little bit of something that seems like nothing, that actually Drew says even to today, he says he don't even remember doing that. So how many of you have maybe done something like that? You probably don't even remember it, but you definitely wouldn't think that it was leadership quality, right? But how many of you have had someone in your life that has done something, regardless of how small it is, but it changed the course of your life for the better? You've done, they said something, it could have been a word, could have been something they've done, but it set you on a different course that put you in a better place, causing you to be where you are now. How many of you have experienced somebody in your life like that? And, and many of us have. And many of you who don't think you have done anything like that, maybe the only reason that you don't think that is because the person just hasn't told you yet. Just like this girl, she didn't tell him to the last day he was getting ready to leave, four years. As a matter of fact, she said, it's been four years, and she said, by the way, I'm still dating that young man. And then he said when he moved to Toronto, a year and a half later, he got an invitation to their wedding. And so you, you just begin to build something on a life where you've changed a life, and it, it put him on a different course. That's, if you Google him now, you talk, you'll see he's written a book, he's done some things. Because he talks about now leadership as being something, it's an everyday thing, not some big, huge, change the world thing. It's something that we need to do as we do it on a daily basis, but we need to see ourselves as a leader. And, but many of us, we are afraid even of that term. We think that, you know, this is too much for me. Uh, one of the things that Marion Williamson said is that our greatest fear is not that we are inadequate in what we do, especially when we talk about leadership. But she says our greatest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. In other words, we actually have so much power on the inside that that's what we are really afraid of. And so what I'm saying today is we've got to learn how to overcome that fear because deep down on the inside of each one of us, God has created us to become a leader. Every single one of us. And I know we got... We're probably wondering, you know, if, how's everybody going to be a leader? But we've got to learn how to overcome that fear and become what God has put in us to become. So I want to talk, I want to share a story as a narrative in Scripture of someone who dealt with something like this. But then I want to show you that God really created each one of us to be a leader. And this story is the story of Moses. Many of you, if you've been around church for any period of time like I have all my life, <laughs> then you've heard stories about Moses. I mean, his story begins with, you know, his mom um, with actually Egypt. A after the children of Israel had come to Egypt because of a famine and now they're in Egypt, but they began to grow and multiply. And they became so many that the Pharaoh became afraid that they would actually take over. 
And so what the Pharaoh did was order that all of the baby boys be actually killed, thrown into the Nile. And so Moses' mom, she put him in a basket and put him in the Nile, and then Pharaoh's daughter found him. That's the way the story goes. She found him, and Moses grew up as a young man in, in Egypt as one of the kids of the Pharaoh, having everything that he needed. And later on, but he knew he was a Hebrew. And later on, one day he's out. It, I mean, that means he's like a prince. So he's out like a prince of Egypt, but he sees one of the Egyptian leaders beating a Hebrew, and he couldn't take it. So he didn't just beat the Egyptian leader. He killed him. So Moses becomes a murderer, kills the Egyptian leader, buries him in the sand, thinks that it's over, but then somebody says something to him. The next day he sees, or next time he sees a couple of Hebrews fighting, and he says, wait a minute, guys, don't fight. You're brothers. Don't do that. And they say, what you going to do? Kill us like you killed the Egyptian? Then he knew. He was like, oh, my God. They knew? So he knows he's a murderer. It's just like, it's the same reason why criminals, if you know, you see somebody kill, see them kill somebody, what do they do? They say, I got to kill you because you're going to tell. I got I to gotta shoot you. And so Moses left. But anyway, our story begins here. Now Moses left. He's in, back in, in, um, in his own land, and he's actually where, living. He's married now, has kids, has a wife, has a father-in-law. And this is where Moses now, he's a shepherd. Nothing near like being, you know, um, in Egypt as a prince. But our story begins here. So it says, now Moses was tending the flocks of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flocks to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And this is the place, this is the same place where God eventually told Moses that I'm going to bring you here. You're going to worship. You're going to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, and you're going to be back at this same place that I'm showing you. So here we see Moses' job. Moses sees himself as what? He's a shepherd. It says he had his father-in-law's sheep, and that's what he was doing on the far side of the desert. So he's a shepherd. He doesn't see himself as a leader. He's a shepherd. And many of you, sometimes you identify yourself with whatever you, whatever job you may have. But your job doesn't identify you. Your job doesn't tell you who you are. You know, your job is just what you do. You are far more than what you do. And so Moses didn't realize it, but he's far more than a shepherd. And God is trying to tell him this. So the next verse says, there was an angel... There was, there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it didn't burn up. And many of you, you've heard the story of the burning bush. So Moses sees this bush on fire, but he doesn't, it's not being consumed. The leaves are not turning brown and crumbling and falling and then things are not burning up. It's still green. And so the next verse says, he thought to himself, so he says, I'm going to go over and see what this strange sight is, why this bush is not burning up. And then when the Lord saw that he was moving towards the bush and going to see what it was, then God called out from the bush and called his name Moses and Moses. So now Moses knows that this is God, and Moses says, here I am. <laughs> I don't know what I would have said. What would you have said? You walk up to a bush and it calls your name twice. No mistake. It's like, yeah, here I am. <laughs> and then he says, don't come any closer. Take your shoes off. Take your sandals off. This is holy ground. You're standing on holy ground. And then Moses began to say, we're going to skip down a little bit, but Moses, you know, he's thinking about, take my shoes off. This is holy ground. What are you talking about? So God explains to Moses that I have heard the cry of the children of Israel. They've been crying out to me, and I need you to be a deliverer, to get these people out of Egypt and bring them here. So we're going to sk skip down to the ninth verse. And the ninth verse begins to tell us that, it says, And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way that the Egyptians are oppressing them. And then he explains the story, but look at the next verse. He says, So now, 
And he says, so now go. I'm sending who? You. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people to the Israelites, to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. To this, Moses says, what? Just like you and I would say, right? Because the Pharaoh's like a king. Moses sees himself as a shepherd, and you're telling me you're going to send a shepherd to go talk to a king about letting some people go? So Moses is conflicted about even why God is even talking to him. He's like, you need to find a leader. And many of us would feel the same way. You need to find a leader. I'm not a leader. I am whatever. And then God told Moses, he said, look, regardless of what you see yourself as, I will be with you. And this will be a sign that I'll be with you and that I've sent you. He says, when you have brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, you're going to bring them back to this same place that I'm showing you right here. This mountain right here is where you will be. And this will prove to you that I sent you to do this. And then Moses began to argue with God. He says, Suppose, he gives them a scenario. Suppose I go. I'm not making any promises yet. But suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, now he's not even talking about going to Pharaoh yet. He says, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers have sent me. And that was a big thing when he says the God of your fathers because they all identified with that. And that was the promise that God made to Abraham. And then I, Abraham's son, Isaac, and then Isaac's son, Jacob. And so all God had to do was remind them that the same thing that I promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they, that was like a memory. That was a part of their culture. So God says to Moses, you say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And, they had, and Moses is saying, and they will ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? And then God said to Moses, you tell them, that I am sent you. I am sent me to you. Tell them that. I am. In other words, I am everything that you need. I am, I am it. I am sent you. God also said to Moses, say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. Now, Moses was a shepherd, right? He saw himself as a shepherd, not a deliverer, not any kind of leader. Now, when we look at Moses, we see that he was all of these things. We don't even remember that he was a shepherd, right? We read his story. We think about the Ten Commandments, all of the different laws. Moses was a lawgiver. I mean, think about this. Many countries today still have laws on their book based on what Moses said as a law back then. He's an author of the first five books of the Old Testament. Moses, an author, he's a leader, led the people, deliverer out of Egypt. He led them, got them out. But Moses wasn't ready to see who he really was. In other words, he had to meet himself. God, and that's what God did there at the burning bush was to help him see himself. So when you meet yourself, the real you, sometimes that's scary. Because when you think about what the real you may be required to do, you can do, and have the ability to do, and been prepared to do, but you're not ready to do that. You still see yourself, and you're where you're comfortable. You remember the series Fast Thomasine did on your comfort zone. Many of us, we still like our comfort zone. But many times, it's time for us to step out of that place. So what I want to accomplish today is I want to introduce you to you. God created, and this is what I believe, God created every single person to be a leader. Every single person God created to be a leader. And I know our brain, you know, because I start thinking the same thing when I first start thinking about this. If everybody's a leader, then 
who's going to follow, right? You've heard we said that everybody wants, we've seen people in certain situations where we say everybody wants to be the chief and we ain't got enough Indians to get the work done. You've heard that said before. But God created every person to be a leader. I want to show you in Scripture where in the book of Genesis, the first chapter, 26 verse, and you've heard me talk about this before if you've been around here anytime, but then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. God is saying, let us make man in our image and our likeness. So he makes man in his image. So in, in that they may rule over the fish in the sea and over the birds in the sky and over the animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And the verse, uh, next verse says, so God did that. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. And then God blessed them. And said, be fruitful, multiply, increase in number, fill the earth, and subdue it. In other words, dominate it. Take rulership over it. Master it. You are the leader. And it says in there, we just read it, male and female. So it's not just men that are leaders. It's male and female. Mankind. God created all of us to be leaders. He actually said that. He said, rule, have dominion. That's what the rule means. Make, have dominion over the fish in the sea and over the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So what is it that we don't have rulership over? If you notice, he never said rule each other. He never said dominate each other, but he said dominate everything on the earth, everything that moves on the ground, everything that's in the sky, everything that flies, everything that fish, everything in the water, everything, that, everything, dominate that, rule it. And so that's everybody. God wants every person to be a leader. So here is the next question that I know you have in your mind and I'm throwing it out there. If everybody is a leader, who is the follower? Who's, who's the follower? Who then follows when everybody becomes a leader? Because, I mean, I, you know, you think about it, you say, okay, you're trying to get everybody to see that they're a leader, and eventually everybody will become a leader. And then when everybody becomes a leader, then who's going to be the follower? Well, I have a scenario to show you. Take a look at this picture. This is a picture of car. Most of us don't look at a car like that, but that's a car. Can you identify some of the parts in the car? We see some wheels. We, we see the wheels. We see the seats. We can, <laughs> you see a door. We can identify certain parts of the car. Do you have any idea how many parts are in a car? Take a look at the next slide. The next slide shows us that there's an average of over 30,000 parts in the average car. Over 30,000 parts in the average car. So my question is, thinking about this car and all these parts, what part do you think is the most important part? What part is the leader? I mean, when you th somebody said the assembly, <laughs> if we, when we look at all of those different parts of the car, and we look about, I mean, think about certain parts, you know, certain parts you can do without, right? Because certain parts of the car, you, you got lights, but if you're driving during the day, you don't have to have light. I don't think a cop will pull you over any longer because your light's not on during the day, right? But, but there's certain things that are pretty important. Like a spark plug. Now, without spark plugs, it's not going to run, right? That's pretty important. But what if you got spark plugs and you don't have a battery? Now you don't have, you still need both of those, right? And then you got the battery that sends the energy to 
Oh, well, they'll take, well, it's recharged by the alternator, but then it's, from that it sparks the spark plug, and the spark plugs fire and with the gas in the chamber, and then they begin to move, and that's how the cam moves, and it starts to, the engine starts to work. But even with all of that, even if you looked at the whole engine, and some of you identified the wheels, even if you looked at all of that, none of that will work without the other. So how important is the battery? How, here, you know, I thought about this when I was putting this together. My first brand new car that I bought, no, second brand new car that I bought, I had a head gasket go bad, and I decided to change it myself while I still owed money on the car. I went, I was working at a plant where they built these anyway, so I observed the people that were working on the line. I learned how to do it. I went home, I convinced myself, I can do this. So I went, got Took it apart, took the heads out, went to a place, had the heads ground, all everything, put the gaskets in, put everything back together, and then I was scared to turn the key on. Just scared. I was like, and when I finally did, through the windshield, I saw this blue smoke coming up. And that scared me even more. And I, now I think, now I owe for the car and, <laughs> and whatever it's going to take to fix what I just messed up. So I called the place that I bought all the information from, and they said, well, what did you do? There's a wire that goes from the battery to the frame. And anyways, it had insulation on it. So all I'd really done was that wire was not connected where it was supposed to be, and it just burned the insulation off of it. And once I did that, it was fixed. But that little piece of wire cost about $4. Without that piece of wire... The car didn't work no matter how. Yeah, I had a battery. I had the engine fixed, everything. So what is the most important part? In other words, if we looked at this as being somebody in the car had to be the leader, what part would be the leader? Would it be the little $4 piece? Is that the leader? Where's the bear? You, you guys aren't voting? <laughs> Who's the leader? All of the parts. Okay. So let's move forward then. You're right. Who, all of the parts. In other words, the real answer is no one person is the leader, and then at the same time, everyone is the leader because you need every single part. Everyone is a leader, but you are a leader in the area of your function, where you have function, where you have not just, not that you've been given the authority, um, delegated authority, but because of who you are and what you do. In other words, there are certain areas, even in ministry, where I'm not an expertise, and I may have authority to make a decision, but then I need to look at people who have information that I may not be aware of and that can actually give me information to make a better decision as a leader. And so as a leader, you are a leader in the area where you have a function, where you are an expert, where you're an expert at. So we need to move forward in that. Now, here's the key, because nothing happens without leadership, absolutely nothing. If you want something to change, you need a leader. If, you want some, if there's anything to be developed, somebody has to step up as a leader and develop it and make sure it happens. If you want any kind of improvement, you gotta, somebody has to step up to the plate and make that improvement. If, you want, if anything is wrong, and you need something corrected, what has to happen? Somebody has to step up and make the correction. That's a leader that steps up when he sees something. If you want any kind of advancement, any kind of success, then you got to step up to the plate. Now, when I think about myself, and many people like me who are pastors, we put ourselves in a situation, and sometimes we try to make decisions that we need of the information about. But we need to allow people in the different areas where they have authority to make decisions and give information so that we can make an overall better decision. But the same thing happens in any kind of department head. How many of you ever work for someone, and just because they're the boss, they make a decision, and they don't know anything about what's really happening at your level and why they're making the decision that they're making? Don't raise your hand. And you may be a, a husband or a wife. It, all of us, we are leaders, 
and you're each leaders in the area that you have your function. You're a manager, you're a leader. And there's a difference between a manager and leader, and we'll talk about that next week. Uh, but today, I want to just focus on yourself as a leader. And your challenge today is this. Your challenge is, throughout this entire series as we set it off today, is to first of all, begin to see yourself as a leader. You need to begin to see yourself as a leader because everyone is a leader. You're not just a follower. Everyone is a leader. We all are leaders in our different areas of function, and we all contribute to the overall goal and overall vision to make something happen. So your challenge is to become active. Many of us, we, we see something that needs to change. We need something that needs to be developed. We see something that needs to be corrected. What do we do as Christians? We pray. We spend a lot of time in prayer. In this leadership series, I want to encourage you to move from the place of prayer to the place of being an activist. The things that you've been praying about, you as a leader, do something about it. We become satisfied just because we're praying. Don't you feel some kind of relief when you just pray? You just pray. And you, I believe God, I pray, hallelujah. God is at work now. In other words, I have prayed, I've sent out some forces that's doing the work for me. No. You've prayed and God is trying to give you the energy. you pray prayed and you open your heart and God uses you. So your challenge is to become active about the things that you've been praying about. So here's step one. And we want to do this together today. Say to yourself daily, and say it right now out loud. Let's say this together. I am a leader. Say it again. I am a leader. We need, you need to hear yourself say that. Get up in the morning and look in the mirror and say that to yourself. I am a leader. And the second thing we need to realize is that the world needs me. The world needs me. My community needs me. Flint needs me. Tennessee County needs me. Michigan needs me. They need me. So let's say this together. The world needs me. Let's say it again. The world needs me. And so tomorrow when you wake up, begin to say that to yourself. The world needs me. The world needs me. So number three, find your area of function. Could be your area of expertise. It could be something God's, a passion that God has put on your heart. Something that angers you. Something that you're upset about that's not going right. That's, sometimes that's what births the leader in you. You, you, learn, you choose to no longer tolerate what's going on. You're saying, I'm done with this. You, you're like Popeye. Enough is enough. And what does Popeye say? It's all I can stand. Can't stand no more. Anyway. <laughs> when you get to that place where you can't stand it no more, then you are ready to be, you're turning on that leadership thing on the inside of you. You're discovering yourself. And that's what I want to initiate today is to help you begin to discover yourself, the leader within you. Discover who that is and let that person out. Let that person make some noise. Let that person do some things. Let that person become active. Because I believe an example, I believe that the day the Rosa Parks decided to sit in that seat and not get up. I think she was saying, I prayed about this. Now I'm going to do something about it. If I'm going to keep praying, I'm going to sit here and pray. 
I am not moving. Sometimes it's time for us to take a stand like that because of what's on the inside of us. And then, because you don't know, she didn't know what was on the other side of that sit down. But we all look back at that and look at how it's changed our lives and how it's made it better for so many people. And so you have no idea what's going on on the inside of you. And what you, if you chose to take a stand against something that's really bothering you, it may change, it could change the world, but just change the next person's life. Like Drew did with the young lady who came back and told him four years later. I'm dating the guy, now she invites him to the wedding, but it was all happening. She went through school, everything, four years, and then lets him know that he was such an influence on her life. So, so many of you, you have no idea whose lives you have already influenced. You have been a leader, you don't even know it. So see yourself as a leader, stand up and be the leader that God has created on the inside of you. So I want to pray for you today. If you're here today and any part of this makes sense to you and you want to take the next step if in, in your relationship with Jesus Christ or even with GTM, want to be, become a part of Grace Transformational Ministries, you can let us know. If you're here today in Grand Blank, or even if you're watching online, you can go to our website and uh, go to the part where it says contact and just scroll down and you can type in the information. It's free flowing information. You can type in whatever you want and let us know what step you'd like to take and we'll make sure that we get back with you so that you can take the step that you'd like to take and you can move forward. If you're here and you'd like to do that, we will meet you at our starting point area so that we can walk you through whatever area you, you would like to get started in. So if you will bow your heads, let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning. You've been so good to us. We honor you. We honor your presence. We honor who you are in us. We honor the leadership, the leader, the person on the inside of me that you are calling on to step forward to be the leader. I pray now in Jesus' name that that person that's on the inside of each person that's listening to me, that that person will rise up and become the leader even in their home, uh, wherever they are on their job, that which they have function authority, functional authority in, I pray that it would move forward, allowing them to actually add value to whatever area that they're in, add value to whatever those who are depending on them that will give you even place in that place where you, God, can move through them as you move through others. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.